start recording. Hello and welcome to today's installment of CyberSpeak with InfoSec Institute. Our guest today is Bill Siegel, founder of Coveware, a ran ransomware recovery company based out of Westport, Connecticut. We'll be talking today about the current state of ransomware, the latest attack vectors, and the best defense methods, and the best things to do if you end up being hit. Before founding Coveware, Bill was CFO of Security Scorecard, a New York-based cybersecurity ratings company. Prior to Security Scorecard, Bill was CEO of Second Market and served as the head of NASDAQ Private Market following NASDAQ's acquisition of Second Market in 2015. Before becoming an operator, Bill worked as a distressed debt trader and analyst in the hedge fund industry. Bill, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'd like to start with the basics for people who are just learning about ransomware. What exactly is ransomware and how far back does it go? So ransomware is a, um, a, a, a type of um, malicious um, toolkit that typically encrypts data and servers. And the only way to get your data and access to your servers back is to pay a ransom. Uh, it goes back to about 1989 was the first uh, first technical uh, ransomware case. Um, very rudimentary, um, you know, simple kind of, I think it was called the AIDS Trojan. Um, and then the ransomware that we, as we know today, came on the scene uh, kind of in the, in the early aughts. Uh, and there's kind of two, two things that really led to uh, an explosion of it, which were uh, both cryptocurrency, um, you know, and a way for criminals to get paid anonymously. Um, and then the, the proliferation of, um, of um, new malicious toolkits, a lot of it, which were hacked from our own government, um, that are available and cheap and easy to purchase that have really lowered the technical barriers uh, to becoming a cyber criminal. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, it, um, I was really surprised to hear that it, it goes that far back because it, it feels like it's a sort of a, a story that's really sort of popped up in the last couple of years, but you're saying it's gone back at least to the, to the early aughts but that it sort of really ramped up in the meantime. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I know one of the big ransomware cases uh, from the news a couple years ago was Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, which basically took down their entire uh, records department. And uh, I believe they paid the ransom, is that correct, to, uh, to get their files back? Yeah, I, we weren't involved in that specific case, but uh, mm -hmm. that is what was reported um, mm -hmm. back in the day when Bitcoin was a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently they did pay the ransom, um, and they, I believe they did so just for continuity purposes. I think the reporting at the time said that they had no backups. And so uh, in order to keep a, a hospital functioning, doctors having access to medical images, the data they need to perform surgeries, calendars to, for patients to come in, they really had no choice. And uh, that's really a very, a very similar version of that plays out every single day. Um, with small and medium-sized businesses where they have to make these basically life and death decisions um, when they're not properly backed up and they really have no other options outside of really letting their business get disorderly um, because they don't have access to critical systems uh, or make a small ransom payment. Yeah, is, was, do you think that was a bad decision on their part uh, to, to pay it or is I don't there... Think they, I don't think they had a choice. Uh, with, yeah. Without backups, they, they probably would have had to rebuild the hospital from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, which could have taken years, uh, which yeah. basically would mean closing the hospital. So it's, it, it really, it may sound stark, but that is the decision. It's closed down. Uh, and if you've got the capital to, you know, come back after a period of time, then, then that's great. Uh, or pay the ransom. And this is why you see, I think, um, on the municipality side, because they're municipalities, they're not commercial um, organizations, they're not just going to close down forever, right? You can't have a, the city mm -hmm. of Atlanta can't go away. Right. Um, uh, they, you know, they will, the, the, the taxpayers will foot the bill to rebuild, um, you know, the entire city government's, uh, you know, not only their stack, but um, all of the lost data, all of the lost systems, all of the lost processes. Uh, but for a commercial company like a hospital or a small business, that, that, that's just not an option. Now, moving uh, to the very recent past, within this past week, um, you probably saw that there was a ransomware attack that blacked out screens in Bristol Airport in England. Uh, which caused the airport to resort to pen and paper schedules and uh, yeah, sort of yeah. whiteboard lists. Uh, they did the opposite thing. They decided not to give in and they decided to service the computers internally themselves. Do you think that due to sort of uh, changes in, in policy and stuff that, that allowed them to, you know, make this bolder decision? 
I, I think every single case is different, um, and it really depends on you know what, what are the critical systems, what can what the what can the organization uh, operate on on a day to day basis, and what can't they um, live without. Um, so we weren't inside that situation, so never fully say. Um, but clearly they had enough access to enough systems that they felt that they could safely still service inbound and outbound flights and customers and baggage without access to those systems. Um, and they felt comfortable rebuilding and, uh, or they had sufficient backups that they said, you know, may, you know, maybe they're a month old or, or a couple months old. It's okay to recover from there. We'll experience a little bit of data loss, uh, but it's not worth it for us to give in uh, and make a payment because we have enough we can carry on operations. Um, what are some of the more popular ransomware attack vectors at the moment? I mean, obviously, uh, we talk about the sort of ramifications that happen at the end, but what, what, is, what are the things, especially social engineering elements, that are getting uh, ransomware uh, infections through the door? Sure. So, you know, on the, on, the, uh, on the commoditized side, like the stuff that's hitting most small and medium-sized businesses, it's really low hanging fruit, right? Um, the cyber criminals are going to look for the easiest way in. Uh, a lot of them are operating, you know, their 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 criminal workings just like a business. They want to minimize their own costs, make them the most amount of money, um, and so they'll go after the lowest hanging fruit. And and right now, uh, I would say the vast majority of cases that we're handling on a daily basis are um, are accessed via RDP. Um, so either uh, you know totally unsecured or weakly secured and able to be brute forced, um, and then once inside, uh, with that level of access, the, the attackers are able to do one of two things: they either sell those credentials again to another criminal group that then actually goes in and lays the malware, um, or they're going in and they're hopscotching across the networks, um, laying the files in you know in strategic areas to ensure you know that the most amount of servers and most amount of machines get infected. Um, and then, you know, waiting for the business to come back online and realize that, uh, that they're locked up. But I would say right now it is, it is alarming the number of companies that continue to uh, leave RDP access either totally insecure or really weakly secured. Um, and it's, it's I, I think small businesses really think that, that um, you know, we're small, we're off the radar, we're not going to be targeted. Um, they don't really understand how easy it is to, you know, to, you know mass scanning techniques um, that these groups use just to search for um, these IP addresses that are, are weakly secured and just how easy it is to brute force access. Um, do you know, do you notice at all if the sort of the big ticket, big news item ransomware stories have changed uh, behaviors at all? It sounds like you're saying that people are sort of repeating the same mistakes over and over. Uh, you, you, you'd like to think that they are, but, um, uh, but sadly they're not. Um, hmm. You know, small and medium-sized businesses don't have access to the big budgets, um, and they do still assume that they're not going to be targeted. They read it in the news and they figure, well, I'm so small and my footprint's so small. Um, how could I ever be a victim? Uh, it's not going to happen to me. Uh, so right. I, I don't think it's changing behavior, unfortunately. Hmm. So uh, it, going to, okay, so let, let's sort of like talk sort of practical things. Assuming you uh, get the notification on your screen, the the red, the red, page of death that says, you know, ransomware has been in, infected, um, infected your system, what would be the first steps you would take to make sure that it doesn't spread if that's even possible or not to make it worse? Sure. So the first piece of practical advice is take a deep breath, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, panic. Um, they don't know what to do. A lot of employees don't report it to IT because they're embarrassed. Uh, so the first step is pause, take a deep breath. Hopefully you work for the type of organization where, you know, you get in trouble for not saying something, but for raising your hand and saying there's a problem, no one gets in trouble for that. Um, uh, from a technical perspective, it's important to isolate the machine um, quickly. So unplugging the Ethernet cable and disconnecting it from Wi-Fi are really the first things that should be done to the machine. Um, from there, the, the machine should not be turned off. No attempts to fiddle with the files, uh, uh, trying to go online to find a, a decryptor tool and run it on the files. None of that should be done. It should really just be isolate the machine and then raise your hand and call an IT professional or if you're a small business, call an outside firm to, to, to come in and help. Um, most cases that come to us um, come to us after several days of uh, trying to figure out a solution on your own, uh, seeing if you can even decrypt the files on your own through some method. 
and a lot of time is spent, a lot of downtime costs um, are wasted before the company kind of capitulates and comes to the point of raising their hand and asking for help. So if there's one piece of advice, it's immediately ask for help because downtime is what kills companies. It's not the cost of the ransom up. Your average ransom these days is you know, 1,000 bucks, 1,500 bucks. Um, that's half an hour of downtime for the average small business, right? Mm -hmm. Let alone three or four days. So raising your hand early and getting help early is really the first thing that, that every, every company that finds themselves in this situation should do. If, if a company is coming to you, to Coveware, and saying, you know, my company got hit by ransomware, what is, what is the sort of flow chart? What is the, uh, the process that you're going to do to sort of like help them through this entire sort of unpleasant process? So the, the first step is an assessment. Um, we're going to pick up some information from the company, um, you know, basic information on what they're seeing on their screen, uh, text of the ransom notice, the file extension that's been appended to the encrypted files, um, how they think um, it, it, it got in, you know, if there's internal IT, if they notice like a, a rogue RDP session um, or, you know, remote access installed on you know, some employee's machine, you know, maybe an employee got fished. Um, so we're going to do an assessment. We're going to attempt to do two things. We're going to identify the strain of ransomware to determine if it's been decrypted before. Uh, if it has, that's kind of rare, but if it has, um, we can point them directly to the manufacturer that's published the open source decryptor tool and, you know, that's great. Um, just send them on their way. Um, if they haven't, we're going to identify it. We're going to plug it into our own database of cases to determine uh, the severity, you know, how, how like, what, what's the, what's the, um, the spread rate risk within the um, own, own company, uh, the prevalence out in the wild, the relative cost. Uh, and then we'll start walking down the decision tree of, you know, if we need to make a payment, uh, what does that look like? Um, have prior cases with the same strain uh, been negotiated successfully and to what levels? Um, uh, and what the, what the success rate is on payment? How likely are you to actually get the decryptor tool? And then that's about half the battle. The decryptor tools themselves are their own, um, their own kind of beast. Hmm. Uh, they're fluky. They have their nuances to them. So we have tear sheets on those as well. So um, provided we do get the decryptor tool and key, we can help the internal IT or their outsource IT help actually run the decryptor tool to the maximum success rate as possible to, to achieve the highest amount of data recovery. So we're essentially able to lay out um, a decision tree and probabilities of success at each of these steps before they even have to make the decision of, of engaging with us. Is there a fair amount of negotiation involved with uh, ransomware agents? I mean, are you, is it really just kind of pay the fee or are there sort of like um, actual kind of like, you know, text negotiations, word for word, word negotiations, so forth? So, um, so it, it, it depends. Um, there are certain ransomware types and certain attacker groups that we've identified that it, there's no point to trying to negotiate. And there's others that we've had success negotiating with. And we're able to make that identification early on in the process and, and, and guide the company because that affects time and cost of recovery ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. There's hard constraints at the company level. You know, we're, we're down, we have to get up immediately or you know, we don't have this amount of money to spend, so we have to get it down to a certain level. Um, we establish those parameters up front, um, but we'll guide them through that process. And if it's a, a, a ransomware type and attacker group that we've successfully negotiated uh, before, we'll advise them to what those levels are and how long that takes. Uh, and then it's their option whether or not they want to pursue that. So assuming that they don't have the money to, to pay the fine and you have no choice but to just take the hit, uh, what is the sort of post ransomware recovery look like, um, you know, given that you have some amount of time to get your system back online? So after the, the decryptor tool is received, it really depends on the amount of data um, that's been encrypted. Um, it typically will take just the actual uh, decryption process will typically take a couple of days, depending on the amount of data, just the, the tool is just running and running and running. You know, if it's a small machine, it could take a couple of hours. Um, but the given company, um, it'll take it at least a day or two. Uh, and then from there, you know, the full, you know, wiping, um, uh, reformatting machines, and then obviously putting, you know, new, new tech, new, new procedures in place as well on the back end. Hmm. Uh, so uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, different options once you get hit, but sort of what uh, up front, what, what do you think, um, uh, sort of educational programs should be in place. What, you, you mentioned sort of closing the security backdoors and stuff, but do you have any sort of like educational or security awareness strategies for uh, general staffers to avoid ransomware? 
For sure. So part of our, our service, we're a 100% we're channel company, so we distribute uh, through the managed service provider of our channel. Uh, and part of our service, in addition to having our, you know, our incident response products um, on, on standby, is all the data that we collect informs what we like to call our preventive strategies. And part of that, in addition to like alerts and analytics, um, is um, security awareness training. And this goes beyond uh, that, you know, don't click on suspicious files. What we'll do is we'll, we'll observe, you know, things like RDP, but, you know, uh, I would say like the, 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 the root forcing of RDP is about half of it. The other half is employees getting fished. Um, and so we'll look at the specific ways that it's happening. And when we see a pattern, we'll write it up and put it into a deck and send it out to our partners and say, this is what's going on right now. We've seen 10 cases over the past, you know, seven business days. Please advise your clients that, you know, they need to be careful of this because it's going on, you know, currently. Um, so that, it, it's a big part of, of prevention, right? Uh, the, the employees uh, at the company are always the weakest link in the chain. Um, and, you know, no amount of training um, is, is really enough. What we also do is we, we try and contextualize it. Um, because training can be boring. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, with, you know, with fishing, you know, we'll, we'll have our partners uh, demonstrate how easy it is to fish people, right? Because people think, well, you gotta be some technical person. Well, no, you just go to these websites and you punch in the email address you wanna show up and you punch in the person you want it to go to and you send it to someone that's sitting in the audience and you watch it pop up on their phone and they say, oh my God, Donald Trump sent me an email. Um, you know, so we, we try and be a little bit more impactful just to raise, you know, we want to raise people's blood pressure a little bit so they recognize just how big of a threat this is and how easy it is for, um, for attackers to get in. Uh, in the last couple of years, ransomware has uh, really risen in terms of costs of damages and fees and recoveries. Uh, they're saying now that it's estimated to cost up to $11.5 billion in 2019 up from five billion in 2017 and 325 million in 2015. Uh, do you think these huge jumps in cost and damage as, as they're reported in the news have changed at all the way people are viewing ransomware? Do you think people are realizing it's more of a, more of a threat or are, are, like you say, are they still saying, well, I'm a small company and they're just not? Gonna... Well, I, I think it's got, it's tipped to the point now where, um, you know, with, with the, the proportion of companies that are getting hit, um, it, you know, I, I think word of mouth does a, 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 a better job of raising awareness than, than security, you know, when, when we put out a report that's got scary numbers on it or the security uh, firms put out reports. Um, I think when, when the business across the street or your neighbor, uh, when they experience it, um, that's when it starts to hit home. Right. And within the high proportion of businesses that get uh, attacked every year, it's, I think it's starting to tip to that point. Um, but we're, it, it, there's still a big reluctance to spend um, and, and, you know, and make imp improvements. Um, and what a lot of companies don't realize also is it's, you know, you can't spend on this every five years. Like it's it, a consistent investment in IT is your best antidote to these things. You have to have, you have to be patching, right? You need to upgrade. Um, you need to buy new products that do different things because if there's one thing that's true. It's that the attackers, they're not just one step, but they're three and four steps ahead of where most companies are. Um, and you gotta bring yourself up to speed, otherwise it's, you know, it's just a numbers game. Hmm. Now, if we, we've, we've mentioned, uh, you know, obviously ransomware is, has gotten more and more complex and you mentioned that there are a lot more sort of services available and we're really seeing with platforms like Cerber and Satan that there's, uh, that these sort of ransomware as a server uh, service uh, sort of elements are allowing people to hire large-scale organizations that can provide them with professional grade ransomware you know in exchange for a percentage of the final tick uh, take with the uh, bad guys shifting from independent actors to multi-tiered organizations to now you know companies that can fuel even the most inexperienced hackers how is the strategy going to be shifted do you think to keep ahead of all of this mayhem well it's just going to make attacks more prevalent and and frankly you know the the, the downside of ransomware as a service is you end up with uh, non-technical attackers and non-technical attackers um, are, are harder to deal with. We, we're, we're dealing with several right now that we're confident are ransomware as a service, like there's a technical author behind it, but the people that you have to communicate with are non-technical and they're much more difficult to deal with. Um, they don't communicate well, they, their hours are very strange, they are prone to disappearing for, for periods of time. Hmm. Um, and that can impact data recovery rates at the end of the day. And that's, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. 
Um, so unfortunately, it's not good for small businesses um, because your odds of, of achieving a good outcome are less, especially if you do it on your own. You know, we like, uh, we see a lot of folks, they, they get discouraged because, oh, we sent, the, we sent them an email and, and they didn't reply and so we just kind of gave up and it's like, well, you, you know, there, these aren't upstanding citizens uh, manning the Microsoft support uh, phones, all right? They're, God knows where they are, uh, doing what? Like, you have to be very persistent. Um, uh, you have to follow up with them constantly. Like, you have to communicate them in a very simple way. You can't use, you know, you have to, um, you know, um, anticipate their dialect and, and, and whatnot. So it, it makes it just a lot harder to achieve um, a, a good outcome at the end of the day. Um, but it, this is the way it's going, uh, unfortunately. Hmm. That's really interesting. It's, it seems that uh, uh, people who are bad at ransomware are actually more dangerous than people who are good at ransomware. Oh, for sure, for sure. Huh. So what, uh, what do you think the state of ransomware is going to be in the years to come other than lots more of it? Um, well, uh, there, there's going to be a lot more of it. Um, uh, this is a game of, of, of catch, you know, um, catch the mouse. And, right. and unfortunately, you know, with RDP, like if I could broadcast to the world that every small business go and, and, and configure their, um, their RDP settings properly or put 2FA in front of it, or just close it down entirely and use a different service, the amount of ransomware that's going on right now would drop probably 90%, um, literally within a week. Um, now, that being said, it would come back, they would find a new attack vector, mm -hmm. um, they would come in a different way, but that's what we have to do, right? We have to, as a, as, a, you know, as a global community that is trying to improve the security of every company, we have to move, um, you know, the, everybody, you know, the, at the lower end of, uh, of security hygiene, everybody has to move up together. And if you can collectively raise that bar, then the attackers have to get more sophisticated. If there's one real, you know, real, real truth to this world, it's, you know, while the amount of attacks has you know, skyrocketed exponentially, to your earlier point, the technical sophistication of the attackers has plummeted. And we as a security community would, would do ourselves a great favor by forcing the attackers to raise their own technical bar because it will limit the amount of people that can actually do it, right? Um, and so one of the things that, that we kind of strive to in our own mission our, and our mission as a company is to end ransomware period is to force the attackers to raise their own game. So it's harder to get into the lowest, you know, the, the lowest hanging fruit um, on the corporate spectrum. But that's a, it, it, it's a hard challenge, but you know, that, that, that's the world we live in right now. So that particular tactic, like what would you need from, from companies to sort of get ransomware people to raise, to raise their game, as you say, what would, you know, if, if you could sort of enact one law or one policy, like what would it take to sort of uh, make that a, a full scale phenomenon? Sure. Um, well, uh, I, I would say that um, uh, honestly, a good question. Um, security awareness training, number one. Like, I, I would, here's an interesting stat. I, I, I did this research once. I, I calculated the amount of money that companies spend on. Uh, like HR uh, training, right? Sexual harassment training, workplace behavior training, relative to the cost of lawsuits that the average company pays for HR related lawsuits. And then when you compare that to um, uh, losses from uh, downtime from ransomware or, or cyber attacks relative to the amount that they spend on security awareness training, it's totally lopsided. Um, companies need to spend a, at least a commiserate amount Right to make it apples to apples on security awareness training relative to the to the, to the costs and risks um, of HR related losses, and they're not. So if there's one thing I would say, like just take a practical look at the amount that you spend to train your employees to behave properly in the workplace, so that you don't expose your your company to risk, and the amount that you spend to ensure that your that your employees don't click on malicious files and bring the whole company down. And I think most companies, if they did that exercise. Would realize that they are vastly under investi in investing in these areas and that they need to balance it out and that doesn't mean don't spend on the hr side that's right. still very important but it's you know spend a commiserate amount at least on the it side and that sounds like a pretty good uh, prescription with which to uh, wrap up today's uh, discussion so uh, bill siegel thank you very much for your insights today on ransomware thank you very much for having me okay and thank you all for listening and watching if you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in InfoSec Institute to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. 
If you'd rather have us, have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Please visit infosecinstitute.com slash cyberspeak for the full list of episodes. If you'd like to qualify for a free pair of headphones, podcast listeners can also go to infosec.institute.com slash podcast and sign up. And if you'd like to try our free security IQ package, which includes phishing simulators, which you can use to trick and then educate your colleagues and friends in the ways of security awareness, please visit infosecinstitute.com slash security IQ. Thanks again to Bill Siegel, and thank you all for watching and listening. We will speak to you next week.